<clears throat> okay, um, thank you very much. And I thank uh, Sherpil for this uh, great invitation to join this panel on uh, economic recovery. Is there a light at the end of uh, the tunnel? I do realize uh, Sherpil's request to focus on monetary policy to avoid possible overlap so the panel can cover more grounds, address more issues and uh, provide more insights on whether we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. For me, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but uh, we're still navigating it, the length of which we are quite uncertain and uh, roadblocks and speed bumps have just become more apparent. Now I have three propositions this afternoon. One, we entered the tunnel from a position of strength. And I guess uh, sec, uh, ASEC Lambino and uh, Shell uh, actually went through this uh, positions of strength from uh, our many years of uh, gross domestic uh, output performance uh, to uh, better dynamics of inflation, uh, good external payments uh, position, gains in employment, and uh, improvements in uh, poverty alleviation, etc. In short, um, if we extend our, uh, our uh, metaphor, our gas tank was quite full. That's my first proposition. The second proposition is that uh, we did not expect that uh, we would pass through a tunnel, but in there, the headwinds are strong. In addition, there were some roadblocks and uh, speed bumps along the way, and it could take us longer. So it's not a question of, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, there is. But the question is, when do we reach the end of the tunnel? And third, unless we run smarter and hurdle those uh, roadblocks and speed bumps, it is possible we could run on empty tank. To me, this is uh, the big challenge. Okay. So the next uh, slides, uh, slides two to seven, are, I think are very familiar to us. In fact, we saw some of this in the uh, presentation of both uh, Tony and, uh, and Shell. So basically what uh, we're saying in this slides two to seven is that the tank is quite full. Uh, number one, our macroeconomic fundamentals were strong and resilient. And this is shown by this uh, chart. And uh, we have this uh, uh, chart on uh, CPI. Uh, it continues to lie within the target of 2 to 4%, still uh, benign. And then uh, I think we have seen as well the domestic banking system, which continues to be uh, sound based on the quality of assets and uh, their level of capitalization, which is very important at this time of uh, the pandemic. Now this chart, of course, no, uh, shows that the external payments position uh, continues to provide some buffers against uh, global headwinds. In fact, at some points, we showed uh, surplus position in both the current account and the, and the, and the overall uh, balance of payments. Now, this uh, chart was also shown by, uh, by Tony, just to say that uh, our reserves hit a high of 98 billion. That's about nine months of imports of goods and services. And I think the BSP expects this to hit $100 billion by the end of uh, the year. And on the other hand, we have the numbers on external debt at about 81 billion but relative to GDP, it's still close to about 21%. So it's still okay. Um, next, we see that we have good ingredients to sustain growth. In other words, to me, I would call this the additives. Okay? The economy has become more efficient. Our total factor productivity has been uh, increasing and one of the highest in the region, in fact. And, um, we can also see that uh, our demographic factors of uh, young, educated, and uh, labor force has allowed us to avoid the problems of uh, an aging population, particularly the provision 
of pension system and other support uh, support system in favor of uh, the elderly. Now, this chart shows uh, some of the recent legislation and initiatives uh, uh, by government in promoting quality education and, of course, better health. Uh, they, I think these are the underpinnings of, uh, of uh, uh, saying that the demographic factors could be translated into demographic uh, dividends uh, moving forward. Now, <clears throat> the next chart shows the underpinnings of nearly 30 years of uh, sustained policy and uh, structural reforms, which have made our economy more uh, market-based, more competitive, even as uh, challenges uh, remain in various areas of the economy. From 1993 up to the present, we continue to see various initiatives in promoting uh, competitiveness of the economy, more market-based uh, system, etc. Now, this chart will show that we have both long-term and uh, medium-term economic strategies. In other words, we have the ambition 2040, guiding our policies to achieve a more uh, progressive, peaceful, and uh, prosperous society. And against the twin challenges of fighting the pandemic and promoting economic recovery, we have the four pillar strategy uh, supported by the Bayanihan laws. In short, we have a roadmap, even if quite general. Now, in this slide, we're saying that we are suggesting that indeed we face this crisis from a position of strength. Our gas tank was quite full. Now, the problem, of course, is uh, as, this, as this chart will show, we had to go through a tunnel when the pandemic started to go wild. What made it worse is that because lives were endangered, the government was forced to go into various levels of community lockdowns. And as a result, even business activities were also locked down. And I think uh, Shell covered that very well. Now, it has become a delicate exercise in uh, balancing between health and jobs. Okay? Now, we realized one glaring handicap. Our public health management was very weak. And I would consider this challenge as a headwind, resisting our advance and adding more time for us to negotiate the whole length of uh, the tunnel. Now a few words on this headwind. In 2019, and this chart will show that, based on the Global Health Security Index, involving uh, 195 countries, the Philippines scored 47.6% out of 100% covering prevention of the emergence of pathogens, early detection, rapid response and mitigation of the pandemic. So patience and robustness of health system uh, to treat the sick, commitment to improve national uh, capacity and financing, and of course, overall environment and country vulnerability to biological threats. How did we, how did we fare in this, uh, in this international comparison? The Philippines was 53rd in the ranking but we are the lowest among the ASEAN six. Thailand was sixth, Malaysia 18th, Singapore 24th, Indonesia 30th, and Vietnam 50th. The reason is simple. We did not prioritize our health system all these years. The budget has always been too small compared to the huge needs of our people. We are now reaping the wages of our own neglect. Now to avoid our health system from being overwhelmed, we had to impose lockdowns and we also locked down business activities in the process. Jobs were lost, incomes were also lost. Now, in addition, the following uh, slides will show there are roadblocks and speed bumps along the way. First is the late unclear health plan and execution. Testing and tracing uh, came late in the day. The calibration of community quarantine from one type to the other is based neither on science nor evidence. 
social protection was less than complete because the distribution was far from complete and the amounts received were less than the committed amount. Prosecution of quarantine violators was also uneven. With execution problems, we are taking time to test and trace, and in the process, we are lengthening our journey to the end of the tunnel. Second, we have problems in governance. Beyond the disconnect in public policies on health, social protection, and quarantine, as if they are not enough, we heard issues of corruption, especially in the health insurance agency, which is supposed to play a crucial role in assisting our people, especially during this pandemic. We cannot anchor our health policy of survival on a vaccine that may never come in the next six to 12 months. If governance is problematic, it is very difficult to inspire confidence among consumers to spend and businessmen to invest and produce because we are not exactly flattening our own epidemiological curve. And third, there's a lot of uncertainty given all these issues of health capacity, plan and execution and governance. The move to form a revolutionary government is not helping any. This raises the issue of rule of law in the Philippines, which in the trading economics ranking of uh, I think 180 countries, we were number 113. All the other Asian five were higher. Singapore was number four, Malaysia number 51, Indonesia number 85, and Vietnam at 96, and Thailand number 101. Uncertainty discourages economic activities and in turn, economic growth, employment, and of course, income. These uh, three factors are our speed bumps and roadblocks. They retard our smooth journey and slows us down. Maneuvering through many roadblocks further slows us down. It also reduces our fuel efficiency. And in the process, we also waste gas. Now, this is where the president is coming from when he declared uh, time and again that we have no more money. Because of our failure to arrest the virus, we had to stretch the period of the lockdown and multiply the resources necessary to extend financial support to the poor and the elderly, the unemployed, and of course, uh, the small business. How then should we run smarter and harder those roadblocks and speed bumps so we avoid running on empty tanks? and reach the end of the tunnel and see the light. Well, I agree on the general approach of the government against the twin problems of fighting COVID-19 and promoting economic revival. But in the interest of time, I will now focus on what monetary policy has done and what else it can do to help in economic recovery. The BSP has done more than its fair share of heavy lifting. Now, during a crisis, domestic liquidity and credit are expected to tighten and impinge on sustained economic growth. Now, this crisis, like what the IMF managing director, Kristalina uh, Djerjoba, observed, is like no other. It's a global pandemic and no one was spared. Economic activities could not be sustained because everyone could touch the virus. It's plain and simple crisis of confidence. Now for monetary policy, it will have to be extremely accommodated, not only to ease the release of money based on what the markets require, but also an additional amount to also convince market players that there would always be enough. This was what the BSP precisely did. Policy rates were brought down from three and a half percent at the beginning of the year to 2.25% after more than 100 basis points reduction. This is very loose, considering that the expected inflation this year is 2.6% and 3% next year. In effect, we have a negative real policy rate. This is to help reduce the cost of money 
and induce higher borrowings from banks and encourage more investment and, of course, production. Now, money supply has also been released in a big way. 300 billion in direct purchases of government securities and enormous purchases from the secondary market. The chart we see on the screen further tells us about the different aspects of the easy monetary policy of the BSP during these pandemic times. BSP provides forward guidance or what they call open mouth operation. Our, our, our rules were also tweaked to allow easy compliance with the required reserves. Beyond monetary policy, the BSP has also done heavy lifting in terms of regulatory relief for the banks. Four planks of central bank supervisory policies were put in place. And here uh, we outline them in terms of uh, extension of financial relief to borrowers, incentivized uh, lending, promotion of continued access to financial services, and of course, support for continued financial services in terms of more digitalization. Now, what else can the BSP do to help usher in economic revival? Now, <clears throat> my view is that it has done enough. At this point, it should continue to monitor the developments. Monetary policy cannot push on a string, even if the BSP brings down its policy rate to zero and pumps in more liquidity in the system. It can only do so much to encourage more bank lending. There are limits to excessive monetary easing. Ultra low interest rate and ultra excessive domestic liquidity may be a recipe for future asset bubble in the economy. Money can move from banks to equities and real estate until a bubble is formed and it bursts we should be very watchful of this possibility. Not this year, maybe not, not next year, but in the next years to come. Because remember that monetary policy works with a long and variable lag. Now, third point that I want to leave with you is that debt monetization may be justified during this critical pandemic period, but this can never be a permanent fixture of public policy. The law has built in safeguards, although it looks like the BSP charter was amended to increase the space for BSP lending to the national government. Two things must be done immediately, and I believe the government is focused on this, hopefully single-mindedly. One, the health sector should shape up and strengthen its capacity for testing, tracing, and quarantining, and of course, treating COVID-19 patients the curve should flatten. Second, two fiscal support. Two fiscal support should be intensified. I think Shell uh, discussed that at length. And, 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 and of course, Tony. Borrowings can never be relied upon indefinitely. The key is to raise public revenues, but these are hard to come by given the pandemic and economic crisis. There's got to be a big realignment in the budget in favor of health, education, and public works. Pork cannot be tolerated this time. Lump sum allocations should be examined carefully to avoid unnecessary spending. These two challenges gains more, gain more urgency in the light of the deep recession being projected by the IMF, the World Bank, and the ADB. They think that the Philippines will decline by 3.6 from the perspective of the IMF, 1.9 World Bank and ADB at 3.8%. Uh, now on top of that, the market, okay, the market uh, is also looking at uh, some dream assessments and this were released by some bank analysts precisely on these challenges on the possible outcome like higher unemployment, and of course, uh, pandemic uncertainty. How will the Philippines be able to, uh, uh, to, to address the challenge of uh, flattening the epidemiological part? But there are rays of hope, okay? The market is still confident about the long-term prospects of the Philippine economy as shown 
by relatively good death spreads and CDS spreads. Here, we show the death spreads uh, between end June 162 and uh, 130 for the Philippines. In fact, we have a tighter spread compared to Indonesia and, uh, and Malaysia, and of course, uh, Vietnam. In other words, they're still looking at uh, a good uh, long-term long -term prospects of the Philippines. And this is also shown by the CDS spread. CDS is simply um, credit default swap. Okay? They could be game changers. Okay? Uh, the debt spreads and the CDS spreads could be game changers, but they could easily dissipate if we continue to commit blunder in our fight against the pandemic and missteps in governance. It is important that our people are convinced that our authorities are on top of the situation, addressing what should be addressed, avoiding unnecessary and untimely battles, that governance and policy uncertainty would not complicate the execution, will definitely help restore public confidence. Confidence is the rarest commodity nowadays. It is uh, important that we regain it. So if we are able to consider these points and address them in action, we may have the chance of making it to the end of the tunnel and see the light of day before we run out of fuel. But it would be tragic if we had to push through the end of the tunnel in utter darkness and frustration. Thank you very much for your attention.